ready to get started. Um, you know, I'm going to talk primarily just about you know my orthopedic evaluation of hip and pelvic pain in athletes. Um, my name is Charlie Gatt. I'm up at Robert Wood Johnson in front of the University Orthopedic Group. So uh, you know, my practice is primarily sports medicine, and you know I think everyone when my patients come to see me, they say, well, you know, sports medicine is knee and shoulder, which certainly it's much, it's very common. But I work, I'm an orthopedic consultant at Ryder University, and it is amazing how many of the patients I see in the training room that are actually there for evaluation of hip pain. And you know, it tends to be, like, where knee and shoulder can be relatively straightforward in many cases, I find hip pain to be, you know, somewhat vague at times. So it actually is a very common athletic presentation, one of the more common things that we see in the training room. I kind of break it up into two groups. There's soft tissue injuries, uh, muscle tendon conditions. It could be either acute or chronic, and then some bursitis type of conditions. And then skeletal that can either be traumatic, overuse, or even articular uh, in nature. So, you know, we know, well, I know that Bo Jackson dislocated his hip and his career, and, you know, lately with Alex Rodriguez and all the baseball players going for hip arthroscopy, there seems to be an epidemic of labral problems in, uh, in Major League Baseball and sports all in general. You know, those are the things that are easy to focus on, but you really want to get down making an accurate diagnosis is the most important thing. It's just like what Dr. Boyarski said, I don't really want to operate on anybody if I'm not going to help them in the, in the right way to get you know, good outcomes and to have the proper diagnosis. So the hip is pretty vague. So I'm going to start with, you know, some of the more common generic things that we see. Adductor <coughs> strains, which is the most common cause of growing pain in athletes. Um, usually the injury occurs to either adductor longus tendon or the gracilis tendon. It's actually a big problem in hockey. The NHL has an issue with it. They, you know, they looked at the incident 3.2 adductor strains and 1,000 player game exposures. And there's been a lot of research looking at that if you have, if you compare your abductor strength to your adductor strength, and there's a, a um, identifiable imbalance where the adductors are much stronger, that puts the athletes at much greater risk. So there have been some prospective studies looking at preseason hip strengthening work trying to balance out the abductor-adductor strength ratio, and they've been looking at a lower incidence of abductor strains in the, um, in the hockey players, at least. I haven't seen any other reports in other sports, but go ahead. Uh, Dr. Gatt, do you, ha do you know the exact like, ratio that they're looking no, for? No, I don't. That, or is I, it still I, exploratory? I don't, actually, I don't remember the ratio, but it's, uh, this article is in American Journal of Sports Medicine 02. Okay. Probably has the ratio that they've looked at. I think really what it comes down to is just that I don't think a lot of people spend a lot of time on the abductor strength at all. It's very easy to strengthen, even with hip extension, you're going to get some adductor work in, and then your adductor work as well. It's, it's easy to do, whereas um, adductor work is do adductor is a little bit more difficult. And then every now and then you'll see a case of, you know, chronic adductor tendonitis, and, um, you know, there's a rare end time. We do everything we can to avoid doing surgery on those. I've injected them with cortisone, and, you know, have the trainers and therapists work really hard on them. And in the, in the kind of recalcitrant cases where, no, where people will not get better, you know, an adductor tenotomy is kind of the last ditch effort, which tends to be a relatively successful operation in people that have kind of chronic problems. I think that's interesting because I know John Uribe down in Miami had a paper a few years ago on um, adductor longus repairs in NFL football players, saying that if someone had an acute adductor longus avulsion, it would be worthwhile repairing it. I don't know that I would buy into that because I certainly see a lot more problems with, you know, there's an adductor strain or groin strain that are so common that uh, I can't see putting something back, and if it doesn't heal really well, ending up with a chronically irritated, prepared adductor that you may end up in the long run. That's only one paper. I think the general consensus is if someone avulses their adductor longus tendon, which does happen, you can probably let it fly, but it's not, you know, there, there's a little bit of debate on that. Then hamstring strains. This is a, another really common problem around the hip. And when I think of, you know, hamstring strains around the hip, I'm really thinking more of the proximal hamstring strains but you certainly see them in the mid-substance. So again, the NFL and other, like all other sports is a really big problem. Um, this is a, I, I did my fellowship at the Cleveland Clinic with John Birchfeld, who took care of the Cleveland Browns for a really long time. So he looked at all the um, hamstring strains <coughs> at the, in the Cleveland level. They had 431 strains. And he was really very meticulous about taking care of those because it was his, his, his uh, content that you get these guys back sooner with the proper treatment. So in only 13% of the patients where they have a palpable defect. So a lot of times you'll examine them. I try to figure out, is it a medial hamstring strain or a, or a lateral hamstring strain? Is it the semi-membranosis, semi-tendinosis uh, semi group, or is it more on the lateral side where the biceps is? And uh, you, know, you know that once somebody gets a hamstring strain, that's the big, the big problem is they're probably going to get another one in the future. That's, 
the stuff that really you struggle with. You try to say, well, how long should we keep them out? I mean, everybody knows how to rehab them, but when do you send them back? And if you send them back too soon, are they going to re, re injure it? So with Dr. Burfeld, and again, this is with NFL football players, where you know they're, you know, there's a big push to get them back as quickly as can. If he could find a, a, a localized area of pain, in other words, if the entire hamstring just diffuse tenderness along the entire hamstring, he wouldn't go with the cortisone shot. But if there was a localized area of tenderness, he would give them a uh, cortisone shot within 72 hours of the acute injury. His philosophy being that the the initial strain leads to an acute inflammatory response, which is probably the cause of the majority of the pain. And even though by quieting down the inflammatory response, you're actually weakening the healing process, the, the guys could probably go back and play sooner. And he had an average return to practice in seven, six days, no games missed, and had pretty good results. So again, this was published in, in the American Journal of Sports Medicine. A lot of people abide by this. Dr. Bergfeld's really well known, he's talked about it around the country, and I know the NFL physicians are pretty comfortable with it. In the college population, it's a pretty easy thing to do. In the high school population, it's probably a little tough to talk to a parent and say, I'm going to take your kid and give him a shot of cortisone so we can get him back on the field. Um, I do have parents who really put the pressure on to get their kids back you know, as quickly as possible, which is, you know, to me, I, I probably don't throw this out there unless I, I've known the family really long, for a long time and treated them for a while and, and I'm comfortable with them and they're comfortable with me. If it's a new person, they're not somebody at the school that I take care of, then I, I'm pretty much going to just tell them to use ice and therapy and try to get this thing better, but it is uh, something you can do. Now this is a, a case, what we've been looking at a little bit more is uh, how do you deal with a chronic hamstring strain that won't get better? Uh, this will help. And I, I see a fair number of these cases, you know, people who come in with a, a chronic injury, they've had, you know, repeat strain injury, they just can't get better. And this is actually a local high school kid that I'm taking care of. And he's had a, he's had a hamstring strain <coughs> last spring. Spring is lacrosse, he's a good player, he's actually going to a D1 college to play lacrosse. He plays football, he's a starting safety on the team. And all season long, you tell the kid just wasn't himself. Like, and I, he's just so afraid that he's going to re-injure his hamstring. He just can't, and I don't know if it's in his head or what's going on with him, but eventually we broke down and got an MRI. So here's the axial cuts, and this is the lateral. This is kind of the proximal biceps up here. And you can see in this T2 imaging technique where most of the tissue is relatively black or gray, you have this one, the, the muscle's a little bit smaller, and this white line shouldn't be there, but you have the kind of the muscle belly is a little more edematous. And then if you look at that corresponding area on the coronal cuts, that the room's a little bit bright, but Suffice it to say that all the muscle tissue is relatively black, and then this one area, this relatively discrete area, is kind of you know whited out. So the question is, what can you do for this kid? Is there, is, you know, other than telling him, look, you're just going to have to gut it out, live with it, and see what happens. Can we do anything to make him just get over the hump and finally forget about his hamstring? And you know, we, I've tried in the past before I had um, ultrasound. I was going with just kind of look at the MRI, palpate the area, and give them a blind shot of cortisone. We're looking at now is going forward with um, ultrasound guided injections, and I've been doing this a lot in conjunction with uh, Dr. Monaco at Rutgers University because he's come become very adept at looking at uh, at muscle injuries with ultrasound. So what we've done in a couple of cases, I'll just go back quickly. Is that, you know we'll look at this on the MRI and say here it is. Then he'll look at them with the ultrasound machine, and he can actually identify the difference in the muscle where the muscle belly is. You see all the different fascicles. Um, it, it just looks a little bit more dense white on ultrasound. I'm not an ultrasound expert, so I just kind of defer to his interpretation of the films. But when we go back, now this is this is just from a this is an article from radiology. But you know, here's the hamstring tendon attaching onto the ischial tuberosity. And again, this is something I've done blindly with people who have chronic insertional tendonitis right off the ischial tuberosity. You see this a lot in runners, to tell you the truth, and they just can't run. You know, so man, every time I run, I get this pain deep in my backside, and I know it's insertional tendonitis. I've even gotten some MRIs. But here's the ultrasound, here's the tendon, here's kind of the tissue above it, here's the needle coming in. So you can see just because there's a little break in the, in the lines, this is the needle coming in. So you can actually put the needle right on the edge of the tendon if you, for a reason, you want to go right into the tendon. You can be very accurate with your injection placement. So for instance, in that last case, where we had that hamstring strain, and that kid's just not getting better, I could go back under ultrasound and I could make sure, you know, Doc Monaco could make sure that he puts that needle right in the middle of that muscle belly, right where that is. And, and I've done that with cortisone, it's worked pretty well. And then over the last couple of years, I've done a couple of cases with PRP. And I think everyone's here, you know, PRP is kind of the big buzzword, talking about using that instead of cortisone, because it's an injection of, of concentrated growth factors into the site. We had a girl down at Ryder with a chronic quad strain, two years, you know, two years of 
chronic pain never getting any better. MRI showed kind of a long stretch in, her, in the, kind of her proximal one-third rectus femoris, and Dr. Monaco and I injected her with some PRP, and I, that got her over the hump for some reason. After that, like all her pain went away, and she started playing, never worrying that she was going to tear her quad again. So it kind of worked out pretty well. So this is something that I think you know, ultrasound machines have become portable now. You can just put them in your office, or they work off of a laptop computer. You can be a lot more accurate with your guided injections. Whether you want to use cortisone versus PRP, that's probably a uh, whole debate, and I don't think we're going to have that answer for another couple of years about which if PRP is better than cortisone in the long run. But suffice it to say, I, I think it, it definitely has a future in very select patients. Then there's hamstring avulsions. Um, I see these every now and then. Again, they tend to be in kids just as they're approaching skeletal maturity. You know, their growth plates are just starting to close, and they kind of rip their hamstrings off. Um, but you can, see, and so they'll get it with a little bony emulsion fragment right there. And when that happens, it hurts like heck. You know, you know exactly what happens. They're black and blue in the back of their thigh. I tend to be very conservative with these. I think the majority of people will just get better. Recently, there's been a little bit of a push in some sports medicine circles to repair these again. Personally, I think that's a, you're asking for trouble. If you put that back, one of the biggest problems you can get is, is uh, exuberant HO formation. If they form HO at the site of the issue of the problem, <coughs> then they have a hard time sitting. And sometimes you can actually entrap the sciatic nerve in the, in the heterotopic calcification. Then you're looking at doing a sciatic, sciatic nerve neurolysis through the, uh, through the HO, which can be pretty difficult. But, so I, I haven't done repairs, but I know others do them. And that's, again, something that's a little bit open for debate. But I tell you that my hands conservative treatment works in almost all the time. It takes them a long time to get better. I mean, it's not the type of injury where the kids get better right away. It's, you probably tell the parents you're looking at maybe three months before they're ready to go back. It takes that long before that pain goes away. Then iliac spinal ulcers. These are the ones that I think, you know, these kids go to the emergency room, and they usually will happen from an, a, a sudden start for running. So I'll see sprinters come out of the blocks, you know, soccer players take off, and they feel a pop up in their hip, and you know, they, everyone, they fall to the ground, they crumble, they, they can't even think about getting off the field because they have some acute pain in the front part of their hip, and, and they, you know, when they go to the emergency room, they take their x-rays, and a lot of times uh, they'll either miss the avulsion fragment because it's very small, or they just won't have an avulsion fragment. But obviously, if they avulse their ASIS, they're avulsing their sartorius tensor fascia lata attachment. If they avulse their um, anterior inferior lax spine, then they'll have a, uh, a rectus femoris, the direct head, and every now and then, you'll see a small avulsion from the acetabular roof, which is the indirect head of the rectus femoris. These, you know, they come in, they, they can't get out of, they, they go to the emergency room, which I think, you know, that's fine because they're in a lot of pain. And they, they get this little, they see this little fraction, they tell you, you bolster ASIS, and what's the first thing they do is they put them on crutches and tell them not to put weight down on it, which absolutely kills them, right? Because they can't, with their walking not weight bearing, they're using all those muscles to hold their leg off the ground. So that's the biggest mistake. But you just give them crutches and tell them to be weight bearers tolerated. They're a lot more comfortable when they go home how to put, put a pillow up underneath their thigh, take the tension off of the muscle for a little while, let them get over the acute pain. And, and again, these are, you know, these are injuries that you know are going to take, keep the kids out for quite a while. <clears throat> Here's an, an, a picture of an uh, inferior iliac spine, so this would be a rectus avulsion. I actually just saw one of these recently um, at Montgomery High School, and it's amazing. You know, Rob Walusky sent the girl over to my office and said, well, I don't know if she really had it. I just want to check her x-ray, and sure enough, she had an x-ray just like this with an avulsion fragment. She was 10 days out and ready to play. So that's, that's the opposite of what I usually see. In general, these are injuries that are going to take a good three to probably six weeks before you're ready to go to back. So what I do with these is keep their hip flexed for a while, but again, reinforce the fact because they've usually been told by the emergency room, the non-weight bearing state, walk on it, use crutches for comfort, and as soon as the acute pain starts to go away, start stretching them out to get them back feeling better. It's very, un very uncommon to have to fix these. You know, there's a you can read some papers that will tell you if there's greater than one and a half centimeters of displacement, they have to be fixed. I've fixed about two of these in my entire career, and, only, and the only ones that I've fixed have been because of chronic pain. In other words, I've never looked at one and said, that's so displaced that it needs to be fixed. That I let them go, and then you know, a year later, they say, man, it still hurts, and we've gone in and fixed it, but it's uh, relatively uncommon. So here's a case of a ASI, I suppose, and this is actually from a, a manuscript, but I didn't have a picture of it. You know, taking this big fragment, this is chronic, you can start to see some bone changes in there, just kind of cleaning that out and putting it all back um, together, and I think that works pretty well. But again, it should be one of your last-ditch efforts to get those people back. 
Um, rectus strains, again, I think, you know, rectus femur strain is very common, especially because it's a two-joint muscle, crosses the hip and the knee. Um, common in soccer and swimming, the soccer players, as they go back in extension and kick through and pop it, um, they complain of a groin pain. One of the interesting things is if you get that acute avulsion of the rectus femoris and, they come, and it pulls down into the thigh, they'll see that mass in their thigh. What I do when I examine them is first I press and see everything. When they're in a relaxed state, you won't feel it, but I ask them to do a straight leg raise. And as they do a straight leg raise, you'll see that bulge in the proximal one-third of their thigh. I mean, I know what that is. That's a rectus femoris avulsion. Interestingly, like one of my you know, resident partners, we saw one of those in clinic, and he sees this bulge in the guy's uh, groin, and he says, oh, this is, uh, I think this guy's got a tumor and wants to do a whole million dollar workup. Well, Dr. Beckler, my partner, is with me, and he, he pulls down his scrub and says, oh, no, I got one of these too. It's a rectus femoris bulge, and he just pulls it down his thigh. So when you see that bulge, again, if it's something that's constant and it doesn't move, you know, we always do worry about tumors and things like that. I don't need to make light of that, but you know, if it goes away when the thigh is relaxed and then pops up when they do an active straight leg raise, you can assume it's going to be a rectus avulsion, which you see right there. With these, I look for a positive rectus stretch test. So when I, if someone just having, instead of an avulsion, but just more chronic rectus tendonitis, I'll lie them prone, you know, and have them pull their heel to their backside if they have some pain through the rectus. That may be a sign of it, but then I, with their, hip, with their knee hyperflexed, I then lift their knee off the exam table, and again, that will recreate their symptoms trying to kind of pinpoint the diagnosis of, of where this pain is really coming from. And again, especially in swimmers, I've seen a lot of rectus uh, uh, tendonitis that won't go away with therapy, and I've used cortisone shots pretty liberally in that area to try to get them through you know, the difficult part of their season. It seems to work out pretty nicely. Quad contusions, another one. You know, this is more common in football than any other sport where you can have a direct blow to the front of the hip, and you know, uh, what happens is of they, they're running, their muscles contracted, they get hit with a helmet, or, with, or they get kicked, or whatever the case may be, and they get, end up with a big quad hematoma. Um, you know, what we've always done with these is to try to minimize the bleeding, immobilize the leg in hyperflexion for about 24 to 48 hours. I mean, you can strap them, you know, wrap them with an ace band, and strap their heels, whatever you want to do. And obviously, they're not going to wear that for an extended period of time, but the more they can keep their hip flexed, the more they're going to minimize the size of that hematoma and keep it to a minimum. Um, sometimes you can actually palpate it a few days later. Um, there's been talk about aspirating them under ultrasound guidance. I always get a little bit worried about infection by sticking needles into a, a bloody area, but it has been done and kind of worked out okay. The thing that I worry about most and I watch for with these cases is myositis ossificans. So you start to see early on, if you, they're going to come in, you're going to take an x-ray, make sure they don't have a fracture, which if somebody's walking on their leg, they probably don't have a fractured femur. But in any event, you know, you won't see anything. But then. And so they start doing well, and actually, you know, they get over the acute pain, they start, you know, rehabbing nicely. You're getting their motion back in the training room, everything's looking good. And then around six weeks, they start to tighten up again, and you can't quite figure it out. You say, what's going on? This is, uh, all of a sudden, the guy's starting, I'm losing it, he's, I'm not getting it, I'm losing knee flexion, he's complaining of more pain. Send them back for an x-ray, because that's when you're probably starting to see the beginning of myositis, myositis ossificans. And when I see that, first thing I do is get them on Indocin right away, because it's a, there's a big inflammatory response around that new bone formation. And in, in my experience, if I've kind of shut that down with about a two-week course of Indocin, as long as it doesn't bother their stomach, it minimizes the size of the HO and the MO formation, and they, then they get back pretty well. And as soon as they get on the Indocin, you know, maybe three days later, you start to see that flexion starting to come back. It's not going to prevent the myositis ossificans from forming, but it will keep it to a minimum. I've been pretty lucky with that. Um, if, if you have really exuberant uh, ossification forming, and you say, I'm going to, at some point, that's going to have to be removed because it sticks out through the thigh or it's just an area of chronic pain, you definitely want to wait at least 9 to 12 months before you take it out because if you operate, if I operate on, my, on that, when it's actively growing, it actually gets worse instead of better. So the key is there's some studies that will tell you get a bone scan, make sure the bone scan is cold before you take it out. I mean, I think usually that's around 9 to 12 months, and certainly only if it's symptomatic. I mean, sometimes the kids will say, look, I can feel that hard bone underneath my quad. And I say, well, does it hurt? Does it stop you from playing? Are you running slower because of it? I mean, they really have to convince me you want to go digging around in there, because I'm going to tell them and their parents that, if, you know, if I go operate on there, there's a chance it's just going to come back again and maybe worse. So I try to kind of scare them away from the operation. They really have to be pretty symptomatic to want to go through that. Hit pointers, I, I was surprised, actually, and how many of my orthopedic residents don't know what a hip pointer is? You know, if this here's again a hip pointer, and it's down, so you know, I'm sure you all know it. It's a subperiophthalmic hematoma over the iliac crest. 
I've seen you know pretty relatively bad cases where there's a lot of uh, echolosis on the skin. You know, again, with the with the, these new portable ultrasound machines, you may actually be able to identify the hematoma, and if it's really really painful, you know you could make an argument to put a needle in there and draw the blood out of it. You can be pretty accurate with your placement of the needle and get it out. But in general, they just requir require ice and rest. But um, it's a term that's thrown around so loosely over time. I think a lot of people who come in with trochanteric bursitis, you know, they'll come and say, hey, doc, I have a hip pointer. And I said, well, did you fall on it or whatever? And they say, no, when I run, I get this pain on the side of my hip. And, you know, the patients don't know what a hip pointer is. I think everyone in this room probably knows what it is, but just something to cover in a comprehensive diagnosis. Then piriformis syndrome, another one. This is kind of a, one of these diagnoses of exclusion that I see from time to time because uh, you know patients come in and they say I have this pain in the in the back of my hip, and it usually occurs with long distance runners. I find most commonly, but the other ones that I've seen that in in athletics is a direct blow to the back of the hip. So either somebody that got kicked, you know, right in the backside, or somebody that you know took a helmet to the backside, or whatever the case may be. And from that, then they get this real bad pain, you know, deep down in the back of their greater trochanter. Um, sometimes they'll get sciatic nerve symptoms, and sometimes they, they won't. Because theoretically, what really piriformis syndrome is, is a tight piriformis tendon that's pressing on your sciatic nerve. And so the ones that I look for in the runners, I'll ask them, are you having any pain going down the back of the leg? I, truthfully, very few people have actual sciatic nerve type symptoms going down the back of the leg. I find. The majority of them just complain of this aching pain back there, you know, right where you know where the piriformis tendon attaches onto the piriformis fossa. So when I first see it, you know, I, was, I kind of give them a full exam, take x-rays, I don't really get too many MRIs for this particular problem, and the first thing I'll do is send them to, you know, to therapy, do lots of piriformis stretching, and see if that helps. And in the majority of cases, it gets better. If that doesn't get better, you know, they'll go with a uh, cortisone injection. Again, I used to do them blindly. I, there's a a lot of reasons why, where I know where the piriformis tendon attaches, and I'm pretty sure I can get there accurately, but now with ultrasound, you can get there even more accurately. <coughs> in the worst case scenario, you say, well, if you give a cortisone inject injection, don't you risk rupturing the tendon? Well, sure you do, but if they rupture their piriformis tendon, their problem will probably go away. Because what's the surgical solution to the problem, and, it, it, and I'll probably do like one or two piriformis releases a year, is I'll just go in and, and cut the tendon away from the greater trochanter, from the piriformis fossa, I kind of release it on its superior and inferior surface, kind of get rid of any adhesions that are forming, but I, I don't even like to, you'll see the sciatic nerve, but I don't do a sciatic nerve neurolysis. I think once you release the tension on the piriformis, the problem goes away. But again, it's one of those things, I don't want to be known as the piriformis release guy because there's a lot of big hip pains that probably aren't piriformis syndrome, but it's, you know, when people go on the internet, especially the runners, you know, they love to come in and say, Doc, I think I have piriformis syndrome. I think a lot of them just have some form of tendonitis, and it's hard to even put a name on it, but piriformis syndrome is thrown around a lot. So as common as it's described, it's not that commonly diagnosed. Then athletic pubalgia, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, obviously, because so Dr. Boyarski did a great job talking about it. But again, for me, that's, it's one of those diagnoses that when kids come in and they say, look, I have this kind of vague pain in my groin, you know, that's one of the things that I have to think about. And as I will, you know, a lot of my talk later on will focus on hip arthroscopy. I would tell you, five, six, seven years ago, uh, athlete, athlete turning was the big buzz in the sports medicine circle. We talked about it all the time. There were all these lectures, and he does a real, he does a great repair. You know, I heard all the talks about mesh. I've heard about endoscopic mesh put in from inside the abdomen and all, and I, I'm not, I don't do the operation. I would never want to do the operation. I just rely on an expert, but there was a lot of buzz. And it seems to be now that hip arthroscopy is becoming more popular. In the orthopedic literature, we're not hearing, we're not, or the orthopedic world, we're not hearing about it as much, but it still is a really big problem. And I'll tell you the one thing that I know that I like to hear, you know, number one, send the patients to physical therapy, and number two, if they, or, you know, rehab them, if they take that rest, and then they go back, and the first day back, they have the same symptoms, like, immediately, then that's what it is. I mean, that, to me, that's a very reliable find, you know, kind of history finding, that rest made me better, but then as soon as the trainers cleared me to go back, same exact pain that's probably going to be an athlete's hernia. And I think the ultrasound test has been the most helpful thing for me. You know, in terms of when I'm kind of clattered, I'll say, well, I'm not sure if this is really labral pathology or what's going on. And I'll I send them to Dr. Boyarski. He does the, to me, the ultrasound test is, you know, going to give him some definitive evidence. But he has the experience determining whether these patients really had it. And the nice thing about, you know, sending them to Dr. Boyarski is he's going to tell you if he doesn't think they have it. 
and my experience, I, you know, again, I wouldn't know Dr. Myers if he walked through the room, but I'll tell you, when a patient goes to Philadelphia and he's getting hernia surgery, like they're not gonna go there and walk out and say, oh, you didn't have it. You have it, it's on automatic. You know, I, and I, I don't, I can't believe that's true because you can't, not everybody, has, it's not, you know, you can't have it 100% of the time, but I, I do think there's a lot to be said for kind of confirming the diagnosis of ultrasound, and I don't have any experience with the, um, with the MRI evaluation for this particular problem. So he just went over that. A lot of the patients do have tight adductors. I think that's just a reactive type of change. And you know, Dr. Wierowski pointed out that you know he stopped doing the adductor releases, and now the patients are doing just as well. So probably once the symptoms are gone, the tight adductor seems to go away. So this is another this is another problem that you see with tight adductors, and this is osteitis pubis. See this a lot in football players or any of, any of the players that spend, I find a lot more time on the turf field, and they come in with that pain right in the, uh, right where the pubic symphysis is. And when you see that, you know, all I can say is make that diagnosis as early as possible. Because if this gets to be kind of a long-term setting case of osteitis pubis, you could be looking at six months to even a year before they're symptom-free again. So if I see it, you know, you, know, you obviously press right on their adductors, right on their symphysis pubis, they have pain there. They almost always have tight adductors in conjunction with it. I get x-rays and in the chronic cases, you'll see elucencies in the area. Um, I'll, I'll usually get a bone scan or an MRI. Now I, I don't really get too many bone scans anymore. Almost always get an MRI. I'll go with rest, uh, non-steroidals, but I tend to be, if I'm convinced that this is the diagnosis, instead of going with just routine non-steroidals, I'll go with the Medrol dose pack. You know, put them on, uh, on steroids orally. And that tends to work in most cases. In some cases, that doesn't cut it. I'll actually go with a corticosteroid injection. I can tell you, if you talk to a 19-year-old guy and tell him to stick a needle right in pubic symphysis, they think you're crazy. I mean, the thought of you coming at them with a needle in that area, they just they, they run out of the training room. If they can't play, it's a thing to do. And again, I think if, you're, if you see yourself falling behind on this, where no matter what you do, you're resting them, trying to get them back, and it just keeps coming back, you have to get somewhat aggressive with these cases. Um, and then down in Princeton, we, I, couldn't, I couldn't believe it because I, I reviewed papers for American Journal of Sports Medicine and I reviewed this article on uh, uh, septic uh, osteitis pubis, in other words, an infectious origin for it. And um, I, you know, I reviewed the paper, said it's kind of interesting. I figured I'd never see one of those in my uh, entire career. And then sure enough, uh, Princeton sent me a patient and it's infectious osteitis pubis. Kid comes in, you know, has osteitis pubic symptoms, but he comes to my office. And he looks sick as a dog. I mean, he just he looks terribly sick. And uh, you know, we sent him to the hospital, and they, they did an aspiration, right? On his, uh, eventually, he eventually, he finally they got aspirated. Initially, they had to they had to wait till he spiked fevers for one or two. Oh, that's right. They wouldn't do it initially, but they said, "Oh, why should we do that?" And uh, sure enough, he ends up with that infectious osteitis pubis. Did he ever go back and play? Yes. Yeah. He did. Great. So, you know, who would have guessed? I guess it's worthwhile reading some of the literature that's out there because I would have never said that if I hadn't reviewed the paper ahead of time. Um, snapping hip syndrome. So external snapping hip syndrome is the tensor fascia lata snapping over the greater trochanter. I like this one because usually it's with girls. They come into the office and they say, look, doc, I can dislocate my hip. And they come in the office and they do this. And I say, trust me, you're not dislocating your hip. It's very hard to dislocate the hip. And I tell them what it is. It's uh, the tensor fascia lata snapping over the, over the trochanter. Runner cycle is pretty common. Almost always gets better with stretching and non-steroidals. Um, kind of go in conjunction with trochanteric bursitis. So if they're not getting better, I, I certainly have no problem putting a cortisone shot over the greater trochanter. That's very easy to do. You're not gonna hurt anything. They're not gonna rupture any tendons. So that's an easy thing to do. Um, there are reports of some form of surgical releases. They used to talk about pie crusting the tensor fascia lata, making a lot of little nicks in the, um, in the tendon as it goes over the greater trochanter. Now another, because of hip arthroscopy, you know, doing it arthroscopically, cutting out a diamond over the greater trochanter. I've never seen a case of, a, of this that needed surgical treatment, so I have no experience with surgery. I'd be very surprised if I couldn't get somebody better without surgery on that particular case. Um, the other one, internal snap, uh, snapping of the hip or uh, snapping iliopsoas, is something that does bother athletes a fair amount. I see it, I've seen it in some wrestlers over the years and a lot of other athletes, but it's one of those clicks that you can hear from across the room, like they tell you that I feel a clunk in my hip. I mean, the guy in the back of the room, if I had one, and I kind of bring my leg, usually what it is, I'll ab, you know, kind of flex, abduct, externally rotate, and what's happening is the tight iliopsoas is snapping over the iliopictineal eminence on the pelvic rim, 
but it is really, really loud. And sometimes they come and say, oh, I think, you know, I, there's something wrong with my head that's popping out or whatever they perceive is going on. I ask them if it hurts. If they say no, I tell them don't worry about it. But I do find is that in athletes, it can be relatively painful. And again, the treatment for a snapping so as tending to start off with it as conservative as possible, um, you know, a lot of stretching exercises, some non steroidal. One way to diagnose it, um, what I found is when I examine them, I'll put them prone, and they're almost always tight in internal rotation. So I put them prone, have their legs, and I start to you know, rotate the legs out, to, or the feet out, so that their hips internally rotate, and the, the hips just won't go out. I had one rider wrestler, I mean, he had almost no internal rotation. This kid it just couldn't <coughs> wrestle. We ended up ultimately doing a surgical release on him. The first thing we did was diagnose it with a psoas bursogram. It's been described in radiology, the radiologist can using some landmarks, put a needle right on the psoas tendon bursa, and then inject it and then have the kids move their leg and you can actually see the tendon snap right over the hip of the pelvis. So for a long time when that when this was a recalcitrant case, it required an open surgical procedure. And I when I did these releases, I always did them with one of the pediatric orthopedic surgeons because they release psoas tendons in kids with C P all the time. I figured, oh that you know, this is the perfect expert to do it with. But when we did it on a wrestler, they're like, well, where's all this muscle coming from? And you know, realize that the CP kids have very small muscles and getting to the psoas is easy. Think about getting down to the inner groin on a, on a collegiate athlete. There's tons of muscle there. It wasn't as easy an operation as they thought it was going to be. And they you know, tried to be very careful. And one of the cases we actually, if you're close enough, we saw a little hint of the spermatic cord and stuff like that. So um, those are the things that make you kind of nervous. Now, with arthroscopy, you can actually go through the capsule arthroscopically and release the psoas tendon you know, that way so you're not going through any muscle. So you're seeing, probably going to see it as hip arthroscopy becomes more common, you're going to see a lot more so as releases going forward because it's just an easier operation to do. And so I, I know like I've, I've, I know Tom Bird relatively well down in Nashville, and he's, uh, he's really like the grandfather of hip arthroscopy in the United States. He's done more than anybody. And uh, you know, if he has a guy who comes in and he's got a snapping so as, and he has other intraarticular pathology, he'll do the release in no time. Now, you know, when you do a psoas release, you do note uh, a decrease in hip flexion strength when the hip is at 90 degrees. So if you test them in extension and they do a straight leg raise, you know, they're, they're nice and strong. But if you have them sit on the end of the training table and have them lift their knee up, you do notice a strength. And it probably takes a good six months to even a year to get that strength back. With some of the arthroscopic releases, you can move your release a little bit more proximally. Instead of releasing the tendon, you know, right through the entire tendon, do more of a muscular tendinous release and they tend to get their strength back a little bit faster. But again, that's kind of a, that's something that's definitely, you know, becoming more and more popular and we'll see the, you know, better results with that as time goes on. Um, stress fractures, now this, when I see kids with groin pain, <coughs> stress fracture is something that I always worry about. If someone comes in and they're saying I have, you know, deep pain in my groin when I'm running, it's, it's definitely near the top of my list because the consequences can be disastrous if you miss the wrong type of stress fracture. So, there's two types of femoral neck stress fractures, the tension side and the compression side. Obviously more common to runners, you ask them it's getting progressively worse. It used to hurt the end of the run, now it hurts in the middle or it starts to hurt at the beginning. I'm certainly much more um, acutely aware of it in girls than I am in boys because of the issues with estrogen and you know, uh, the female athlete triad syndrome. I find when I examine them, the two things I look at is I, I just kind of flex their knee up and do a forced inter internal rotation. If they really hurt, at around 40, I'm not trying to get them way up to 90 degrees, but around 45 degrees, and really crank on their hip internally. If they complain of deep down growing pain with that, I'm worried about it. And then the other thing that I do, I just extend their leg and I give them a good solid smack on the heel and see if that causes them a jolt of pain. And then the other thing that I like a lot is just a one-legged hop test. I ask them to hop and see if they have pain in their groin with the hop test. <coughs> They're starting to see those symptoms. I worry about it. Um, so if I have any concern of the femoral neck stress fracture, the first thing I'm going to do is get my x-rays. In the majority of cases, because the trainers send the kids in pretty early, they don't come in with x-ray findings, but if you do see the findings of a compression side fracture, you see this density in the inferior aspect of the femoral <coughs> neck. So that I'll usually send them for MRI just because I want to see how far across the hip it's going. You know, here's a case with a, a compression side femoral neck stress fracture. That you can basically treat with rest. I, you know, I don't let them run. I'll usually keep them running for about four weeks or so and then let them go back gradually. In cases of, of really bad pain, I'll put them on crutches, but they have to be pretty bad. I just tell them to stop running, and that, that's enough. Um, there's very rare indications for surgery because just with activity modification, this always heals. A few years ago, we had one patient in our practice who had like a, a year-long compression side femoral neck stress fracture. It would never go away, put screws across it, and uh, pain went away, and, uh, and it healed. 
Now that's as opposed to the opposite, which is the tension side femoral neck stress, neck stress fracture. This would be as close to an orthopedic emergency as there is. In other words, if I, if I take this x-ray in my office and I see a tension side stress fracture, even if there's not a crack in the bone, but just sclerotic changes, they're going to the hospital, they're getting admitted, and they're gonna get uh, screws put across the stress fracture you know, the next day. Not because I'm worried that they're, you know, that they're gonna not listen to me, but you know, if they're a stubborn athlete and they go out and run and this completes itself, the non-union rate and the risk of avascular necrosis are extremely high. Again, in our community in New Brunswick, we had a guy who was like a 30-year-old runner, got diagnosed with tension side stress fracture, said, well, you know, you'll get admitted to the hospital electively, we'll put screws across. Well, that night went home, fell down the steps, broke his femoral neck the rest of the way through. You know, it was only minimally displaced. They fixed it with screws, it never healed, the head went on to AVN, and at 35 years old, he had a total hip replacement. So again, now that's my, my one terrible story that I was, you know, had heard about, and that made Jade the way I do things, but this is something that you don't want to mess around with. And again, you know, in female athletes, you know, with the dietary issues and the calcium intake issues and everything that goes along with it, you have a girl with groin pain, you know, I would say be very aggressive and work them up for femoral neck stress fracture because the consequences can be severe. Luckily, tension side injuries are extremely rare in comparison to compression side injuries, I and mean, they're just much more common. And this is the other one, you know, that you always have to be careful of, especially, you know, down at this would be more at the junior high school level, you might pick it up in a freshman, but the slip capital femoral synthesis. So they don't, surprisingly, they don't come in complaining of groin pain all that often. What they complain of is superior knee pain. So they'll come in and say, you know, my, my thigh hurts, I have pain above my knee, and they tend, they tend to be a little bit overweight as a rule of thumb, um, and you examine them, and what I find is that when I examine them, I lie them on the exam table and I passively flex their hip up. And as I passively flex it up, they externally rotate. And why is that? Because if you look at this x-ray, their femoral head, the epiphysis, is falling off of the neck. and kind of So that leads to the external rotation that occurs with flexion. Now, in most of the cases, you, the kids that will come in, they'll say, look, doc, I'm getting this kind of chronic pain in my, in my thigh, in my upper knee, and I, you always worry about a slip. And I've picked a couple out. Actually, I've picked up two in the office this year already which is you know, common because they went a few years without. But um, the other possibility is they, get, they come in and they say, now they're in acute pain. I'm in really, really bad pain. What's happened is they've had a chronic slip that's just about ready to go, and then, then they come in with the groin pain, and that's when they've completed the slip, and it really falls off a lot. We had one that fell off so far that uh, I sent them to the Peter ortho guys. They actually did a surgical dislocation of his hip and reduced it and put it back and probably saved this kid from a hip replacement you know, at a relatively young age. So it was a big save. But, I think slip capital femoral epiphysis, if you're dealing with younger athletes, and again, junior high school, maybe freshmen, you're not going to pick it up in, in, the, in the upper high school population because their growth plates start to close. The surprise about that one kid I told you about, that he was a freshman at a high school. He was a big kid, just didn't fit the picture of, of, a, of a slip, but for whatever reason, you know, he came in with this acute slip and his head had fallen all the way off. It was a pretty bad case. So something to always kind of keep in the back of your mind. And that's, you know, as they go through this like laundry list of differentials, you got to think about what are the things you know, if someone pops off an ASIS or a, an erectus avulsion, big deal, you know, that's going to be fine, but these are the things you don't want to miss, and they all sound the same, because this guy who came in with the slip also sounds like he, you know, could have avulsed his rectus for the same thing, you just don't know when is what it's going to be. And there's so many different uh, diagnoses around the head. Now, iliac apophysitis is something that I've actually seen a lot of, um, and I'm surprised at, at how much of it we see. It tends to be in runners especially the girls who are sprinters, and they come in, and their pain, as opposed to being in the groin, is right on the anterior aspect of the iliac crest. And they tell you, the more I run, the more it hurts, the more it hurts. Um, and I, is it a precursor to one of the avulsion injuries, like an ASIS avulsion? I haven't seen anybody avulse one, but I've seen kids who are basically debilitated and can't run. So here's an MRI of a patient that I took care of, and here you can see the normal marrow signal of the, of the anterior um, iliac crest, and here you can see the edema changes in it. Here's another case, this woman we took care of, this girl comes in, you know, she's getting ready to close her growth plates because you can see the top of her iliac crest, but here and here you can see it just looks a, a little bit more dense than normal, and on her bone scan on the right side, you can see the iliac crest is hotter than the left. Those are cases where they just need rest, you know, you just tell them, look, you gotta stop running. You, you can't run through this because it's gonna get worse, and then, so it's hard to convince runners to stop running, but eventually when they can't, you know, if they're not, performing as effectively as they want to, they realize that the only way to get over this is rest. And you know, for the most part, once this growth plate closes, they're gonna outgrow it. So it's almost like Osgood slaughters of the uh, iliac crest, if you want to put it in simple terms. 
sacral stress fractures, again, this is something, you know, a lot of people who come in with hip pain, they say, you know, they say hip pain and they say, that my hip hurts back here. Well, I mean, that is the gluteus and everything, but the older people that I see that, it's almost like always related to their back. So if people come in and complain of kind of a deep low back pain, the one thing you can think about is the sacral stress fracture. I've seen a few of these cases, they tend to not have any ridiculous symptoms. They tend to have a lot of hamstring tightness. Um, and I've missed this on bone scan and only picked it up on MRI in a couple of cases, but it's something that pops its head up about once every two years, something to think about and, and keep into your differential list. Doesn't usually result in any signs of groin pain or anything like that. Hip dislocation. So again, I, you know, I do cover games on the field and, I, and I've actually been around, I'll show you a video of a hip dislocation that I, that I witnessed. There's two types of dislocations. There's posterior dislocations and anterior dislocations. The posterior dislocations fall, occur from a fall on a flexed knee. The hip is usually, uh, they're laying on the, on the ground, adducted and internally rotated. And the danger with hip dislocations is that, you know, once they're, even if they're reduced acutely and, and in a reasonable amount of time, they still have a relatively significant risk of avascular necrosis and articular fractures. Um, they do require an urgent reduction, an assessment for loose bodies, and assessment for fractures. So here, this is Eric Nussbaum, is great. He, he always feeds me videos and pictures and everything, so I have to give a lot of credit to Eric when, uh, when I have good, decent video. But this guy that's highlighted, we were covering this game on a Friday night in Hillsborough, and if you just watch him, um, he, gets, he basically gets buried under the pile. And what's interesting about this case is I had just given a talk on, on uh, dislocations in athletics. And I, was, I went through everything from shoulder to elbow, you know, to ankle and all that kind of stuff. And I said, I'll, I'll reduce anything on the field. But I said, the one thing that I won't reduce on the field is a hip dislocation. And the reason why is because there's a relatively high risk of, of a femoral head fracture when you dislocate your hip. So this kid goes down, he's buried under this pile, and I run out on the air, you know, waving frantically for me to come out. So I go out, and there he is lying with his leg across his body, he's screaming in pain. So I said, you know, the ambulance is right off the field, and I said, uh, get them out here right away. Well, for whatever reason, it was taking them forever to get out onto the field, and I'm staring at, looking at this kid, staring at him and thinking, like, you know, I, got, I can't stand this watching. So I told Eric, I said, just hold down his pelvis. And I gave him a little bit of a yank, and I could tell it was gonna go, so I pulled him up and I popped him back in. So I popped him in right on the field, and it's amazing, like, you know, I think you've all probably reduced shoulders on the field. If you do something acutely, reduction of dislocations are really easy. This kid wanted to get up and play again. I was like, do not move. You know, like, put him on the stretcher, strap him down, because I was so worried that he could have a, a femoral head fracture. And again, you take a 17-year-old kid with a femoral head fracture that's now displaced, you know, you could do some serious damage to the hip. So I sent him off to the hospital. He got x-rays, and thankfully there was no femoral head fracture. That was in the fall, he ran track in the spring. But six months after the dislocation, I, um, I got an MRI of his hip. I think I put that on, I don't know. Just to double check, but again, this would be my normal routine. For a, for a documented dislocation, I get a repeat, an MRI of his hip hips at six months. You see, there's no real significant labral pathology, but what am I worried about? I wanna make sure this kid's not going on to avascular necrosis. Because if he goes on to AVN, you know, then you, you, there are some operations if you catch it really early you can save the hip by doing a core decompression or something like that. The problem is a lot of these dislocations, you know, the kids, depending on where they are, it may take them a while to get to the hospital. And by the time they get to the hospital and then they get an orthopedic surgeon to come in and stuff like that, sometimes the hip can sit out for a few hours and there's some evidence that says if the hip isn't reduced within 24 hours, the rate of ADN goes up much higher. So, you know, luckily this kid was reduced in a matter of minutes, but, I, you know, I'll probably, hopefully never see that again in, in my career, but you never know. Probably the next time the ambulance will get out there faster and I won't pop them back in. I, just, I was just so uncomfortable sitting over the kids deciding what to do. Kind of a weird case. Now here's another case, and this is what, let me go back. Eric sent me this one. This is from Colts Neck. And uh, interesting case here. We used to watch this kid. He doesn't really get buried under the pile. But he comes down, you know, lands kind of on his knee there. It's hard to really see exactly what happens. They're going to slow it down. And again, Eric told me this guy just you know, dying in pain, can barely get up in all you know, acute, acute groin pain. Um, so he had to be, you know, very appropriately send him right off to the hospital for an x-ray.
and uh, here's his x-rays, and what you see is that he has, uh, on the AP view, it's hard to really appreciate it, and this is why you have to kind of be aware of these things. He's got this fracture line right on the posterior wall of the acetabulum. So this is an AP view, which doesn't show up very well, but when you get a view called the Jude view, and this is called the um, obturator oblique, and you see the obturator for Raymond, you can see his posterior wall fracture. So again, this is a kid who probably either had a near dislocation or a subluxation of his hip that you know spontaneously reduced or never came out. This gives him just as much risk for developing ABM in the future, you know, because you don't know what happened to him. So he does need to be followed. You know, he obviously didn't play the rest of the season and had to wait for that to heal. But uh, from what I hear, he did all right afterward. All right, so that's dislocations. And then, you know, I think you know what I tried. I'm going to try to spend a little bit more time on today's label tears and the whole concept of femoral acetabular impingement because it's kind of catching a lot. So, you know, label tears again. If you think about, go back about three, four years. All the label tear business really started to become a big deal. The baseball players were having trouble with label tears. Football players, got, it was a big problem in golfers for some reason. Golf was, I mean, a lot of the pro golfers on the PGA Tour have had their hips scoped. So, you know, I, you know, what we were looking for was now looking for mechanical symptoms. People saying, you know, Doc, I, I feel like my hip locks up on me, or it catches, or I feel a click. And, it's, and again, let's go back to what the differences are. You have a snapping psoas tendon. You know, you hear the snapping psoas in the back of the room. If someone has a little click with the label tear, when I examine them, they'll say, did you hear that? Did you feel that? And I don't feel it, but they feel it, and they feel a distinct click in their hip. Um, so the way I examine these people is, you know, as opposed to um, when I was talking about doing the femoral neck stress fracture, right, flex them to 45 and kind of crank on them in internal rotation. In these cases, now I'm going to flex their knee up to about 90 degrees. I almost put my chest right on their knee and try to actually load the joint. And then I kind of circumduct with that with adduction and see if I can actually pinch the labrum into the femoral acetabular joint because that's probably what's happening is the labrum is getting interposed between the, the femoral head and the acetabulum and that's when they get the click. It's a it's a diagnosis where if I say you know based on their history and based on my physical exam I think they probably have a label tear I'm going to immediately send them for an MRI arthrogram and that's a straight MRI is not going to pick up a label tear in most cases. It's very difficult, so it's almost always an MRI arthrogram. And I tend to, I tend to use, because not a lot of people are ordering MRI arthrograms, and not a lot of radiologists are that comfortable with it, I think you need to be sure that the radiology group that you use kind of is aware of this diagnosis and knows what you're looking for. And whenever I send somebody, it doesn't matter how old, well, I don't say how old, but even a high school kid with a, with a suspected label tear, when I have them get the MRI arthrogram, they have to put the needle into the hip joint under fluoroscopic guidance. Since the needle's in the joint, once the arthrogram diet is done and everything, I'll have them shoot the hip with a long-acting anesthetic and some cortisone. Because that way I can tell, is their pain really from something intra-articular? So if, they, if I do an MRI arthrogram and it comes back label tear, and then I say to the kid when he comes back, I say, well, was your pain better for two hours or six hours or two days or two weeks, whatever the case may be? And they say, like, I got no pain relief at all. And despite the fact that the MRI arthrogram is positive, that probably isn't the source of their pain. There was a really good uh, study that came out of the uh, Orthopedic Academy this year looking at MRI arthrograms in um, hockey players, because there's a high incidence of label tears in hockey players. And there's something like a, you know, 25% of them have uh, positive MRI arthrograms and they're completely asymptomatic. So you have to be a little careful about being overly aggressive in how you interpret these, and that's why I like to do the steroid anesthetic injection. And we'll get into some detail about arthroscopic debridement. You know, again, go back. I know I know Tom Bird well. He's been he's done more hip scopes than anybody in the United States, and uh, you know, he's been debriding labrums for ten years. And I asked him a while back, just about a year ago. I said, "Well, you were taking all those labrums out, you know, ten years ago. Were the patients coming back with problems?" And he said, "No." But the truth of the matter is, now in the younger population, like high school, college age population, you're probably going to try to repair the labrum just like we do in the shoulder, repair the labrum in the shoulder. But the problem is I don't think we've really identified what the role of the labrum is yet. Obviously, the, the labrum in the shoulder is very involved in, in shoulder stability, but the, the hip is really a ball inside of a deep socket. And I, don't, I certainly don't think the labrum provides stability to the hip joint. There's some talk about it acting like an O-ring, kind of sealing fluid into the hip joint, stuff like that. But I, I think this is, it may be a little bit of a triumph of technology over true anatomy, but you know, it's going to take a few years for all this to pan out. We'll, we'll see that in some videos coming up. And then, kind of so, again, it all started with label tears. That's all anybody talked about was a label tear. We're going to cut out your label tear, you'll be fine. Then we said, well, why are we seeing all these label tears? Why are people getting them? 
And that's where this femoral acetabular impingement you know, concept has come into vogue. And this is really now, the truth of the matter is if you see a young person with labral pathology, you're not going to say, well, they had a traumatic event and just tore their labrum. You know, you think there's some predisposing factor, and the predisposing factor is femoral acetabular impingement. But I can tell you, like, you know, three years ago, I had a Rutgers, you know, uh, wrestler comes in with, you know, labral symptoms. I could see his labrum. He wrestled 10 days after the arthroscopy. He's back on the mat wrestling in D1 college wrestling. So, you know, and I don't, you know, I didn't, at that time, that's, you know, the whole acetabular impingement thing was just coming out. We didn't even think about it. He just wanted to wrestle, shaved out the labral hair, boom, gun, ready to go. But what you find with the femoral acetabular impingement is maybe they're not going to complain of, like, a clicking or a catching or a locking, but they're going to say, when I get my hip into a hyperflex position, I get this deep down groin pain and I just can't do it anymore. So, you know, depending on the sport and the reason they have to be in that hip uh, position, you know, they complain of the pain. So, you see it a lot of dancers, gymnasts, wrestlers, kind of covering all sports right now. So, there's, then you look at what type of impingement is there, and it's been broken down into cam and pincer impingement. So, cam, you know, this is what a normal hip should look like a round ball, kind of a, a concave femoral neck head neck junction. And when they have a cam lesion on the femoral head, and we see this a lot in x-rays, even in the general population and the older population, they start to develop like a prominence or an exostosis on the top of the, fem of the head neck junction. So this would be the anterior aspect of the hip. And as the hip is hyperflexed, this cam lesion starts to peel the labrum away from the edge of the acetabulum. So you'll start to see damage to the labrum and then actually start to delaminate the articular cartilage off the very edge of the acetabular rim. And then the other thing that people get is a pincher lesion. And now, instead of having the impingement caused by the femoral head side, as they bring their hip up, so imagine this hip coming up into hyperflexion, like kind of like any extra bone on the edge of the acetabulum starts to impinge on the head neck junction. That starts to just chew up the labrum itself. And I think truthfully what we're seeing is a lot of these cases are mixed cases. So here's just kind of a, a more anatomic picture. This would be a combination of a, a cam lesion at the head neck junction Instead of being convex, it's concave, and maybe a little bit of you know, prominence of the acetabular rim. So what we see is we start to see the labrum tear up, and we start to see this cartilage on the very edge of the, um, of the hip start to delaminate, heal off, which may or may not be a precursor of arthritis. You know, Mark Philippon has really become, he's out in, uh, in Vail, and he does some stuff that is, is definitely on the cutting edge of what hip arthroscopy can do. But I can tell you that he has people convinced that his arthroscopic debridements of these cam and pincer lesions are going to prevent the onset of arthritis going forward. I, I would tell you when I talk to my hip replacement surgeons, you know, nobody really believes that. I think, you know, right now we're just looking to get symptomatic symptom, you know, relief from these problems. So here just this is a, this is an older picture, kind of when we first started talking about acetabular impingement. Here's like a little exostosis on the head neck junction, a little exostosis here. This patient actually has a little bit of early arthritis, so this is a young athlete. And you see after arthroscopically debriding that, there's more room, so now the patient doesn't <coughs> have any high, high degrees of hip flexion or maybe even hip abduction or someone that ducks out that far. Mm -hmm. So hip arthroscopy, you know, the thing is, prior to hip arthroscopy becoming more commonplace, there, there was some people doing work on femoral acetabular impingement but was done with a surgical dislocation of the hip. It was an open operation. Now we can do a lot of things arthroscopically through the hip. It's, uh, it's not as easy as a, uh, as a knee arthroscopy because it requires a traction table. Obviously, the arthroscope doesn't fit between the femoral head and the acetabulum unless you distract it out. So we distract it out with about 20 pounds. We have, there's a lot of x-ray guidance to make sure everything gets into the hip joint. But once you're in, you know, there's a lot of things you can do, and the techniques just continue to grow. So label debridement was the thing we did first. Now we're doing impingement debridements. I've taken loose bodies out of hips. You know, one had one person had an acetabular fracture. The surgeon fixed it with uh, plates and screws. But when they got their post-op x-ray, there was a hunk of bone and cartilage sitting in the joint. To get it out, you would have had to take the whole hip down, the whole repair down, to pull the hip, the piece out, because you can't have a piece of bone and cartilage in your hip joint. So I got snuck an arthroscope in there and was able to get the piece out, which, you know, save them from a really big operation. I've done cases of microfracture where, you, where there's a chondral defect on the weight-bearing surface of the, of the femoral head or on the acetabulum. Microfracture, try to get cartilage to grow back. Synovial chondromatosis is where there's loose bodies floating around the joint, take them out that way. Ligamentum teres tears are uncommon but can cause mechanical symptoms. You 
can debride those, I told you psoas release, and then emerging techniques such as labor repair are becoming uh, much more commonplace. So I'm going to show you one case, and this is, this is a guy, a rider wrestler, anterior hip pain, has been bothering him now for about six months. No matter how much rehab he does, it just continues to have pain. And this, you know, this, for this particular college year, he said, Doc, I can't wrestle. Like, I, you know, if I go out there, every time I get my hip flexed up, I, I feel like I have to stop wrestling. He didn't have any acute injury. The kid's just not getting any better. So we sent him for his, we got some x-rays. When you look at his x-rays, I mean, he might have a little bit of a prominence on his, on his right hip, you know, at the head-neck juncture, but it's certainly nothing that's that dramatic. And then if you look at the, you know, the edge of the acetabulum, again, nothing overly dramatic. Um, so here's this, but on the lateral view, you can start to see, you know, the prominence a little bit more uh, sticking out over here. Then the other thing you do is you can look at the, uh, if there's a little bit of anterior overhang, that's the one thing, this crossover sign, he's got, it, you have to know how to interpret pelvic x-rays, and it's, it's difficult for me to do, but this is the anterior rim of his acetabulum, and this is the posterior rim, and he's got a little bit of overhang here, so his acetabular rim does hang out a little bit more than it should. We send him for an MRI arthrogram, you can start to see the beginnings of his labral pathology. He's starting to tear up his labrum over here, and he's got a little bit of an exostosis on the femoral head neck junction. And th this guy, when, when we gave him his injection, he got about 10 days of good relief. Like he went back on the mat and he was kind of doing okay, but after 10 days, he just said, look, it's all coming back, and I'm just never gonna make it through the season. This is just a, an axial view, again, seeing the prominence at the head neck junction. And this is a sagittal view. You can see that the labral signal here doesn't work very well. So um, he ended up going to see Tom Bird, which I was kind of glad about because you know the, he was having a lot of pain, and I wasn't. I didn't think, even though his MRI arthrogram and his findings were significant, I didn't think they were you know as bad as he was making them out to be. And Tom, has, you know, really like I in my mind, I said he's the grandfather of hip arthroscopy. He's seen it all. So I'm going to walk you through his surgery and actually probably help explain a little bit of what's going on. So here's his, we're going to start off with his labeled breathing. So this is just intraarticular in the head. So you'll see there's the acetabulum um, down in there. If this is the fovea where the ligamentum teres attaches. He's got a little bit of a tearing of the ligamentum teres, which he debrided. The femoral head is right over here. I don't have, I can't record my arthroscopy right now, but here's a arthroscopic shaver coming in. You see how chewed up his labrum is. So you're just going to start, you know, with a motorized shaver, just like we would do with a meniscus tear, or um, you know, a degenerative labral tear. Start to debride the labrum back to smoother tissue, and you can see how this could cause mechanical symptoms in the hip, like kind of getting interposed between the hip and the and the, um, the femoral head and the acetabulum. So first, and again, I would tell you that five to seven years ago, this is all that would have been done to this guy. I guarantee nothing else would have been done except shaving away this labrum. I mean, probably, you know, for the most part, I'll bet you it would have done okay. But the question is, why does he have this? You know, and that's where the femoral acetabular impingement concept is coming into play. Like, why does a 20-year-old kid have this much problem with his hip? You can see back there that his articular cartilage on the very edge of the, you see it's delaminated. So he's already peeling his cartilage off of the acetabulum. And you really don't want to be losing articular cartilage when you're 20 years old. So next, we... The next step of the operation is the pincer debridement. So he's got some overhang of his acetabular bone. So this is a this is a beaver blade which you can put in through the portal. There's actually been a, a fair amount of capsular resection for visualization, but he's actually transecting the labral attachment to the rim of the acetabulum. So femoral head's down here, the, the acetabulum or the socket is in the upper right. The first step we're going to do is just detach this off of the bone. a lot longer, so I kind of put some little snippets of it in there. You have to release it enough because what you want to try to do is, I, is <clears throat> we'll release enough of the labrum so we can work on the bone without, but without completely destabilizing the attachment of the labrum itself. So now, now that the labrum's released, you can get behind it and start to take off that shelf of bone. So the most anti it's hard, the most anterior part of the hip, like the very front of the hip, is way up in here. This is more the anterior superior, so this is getting more towards the uh, kind of more towards the lateral aspect of the acetabulum itself. So this is anterior. This would be the true like superior aspect of the acetabulum, the over on the right here. But you can see first you got to take all the capsule off. So you get down to, to the bone. That's come with that part. Now that's the hard bone now that the capsules haul off. And you're going with a burr next. 
and this actually, you know, this basically breeds the pincer lesion. So now we're taking that overhang from the acetabulum that's causing everything to get pinched at degrees of hyperflexion and getting rid of the hard, the hard aspects of it. Again, so now you can see there's a bit of that, that fur itself is about five millimeters in diameter. So you can see they've taken down a, a fair amount of bone already. So now we kind of, because of that, what happens, again, this um, labrum is a little bit destabilized. So the current thinking now is we should, we should re- So now we're going to reattach the labrum. So just like we do labral repairs in the shoulder, put an anchor down into the acetabular rim. And it's actually just required three anchors. The anchor goes down into the bone, that's the suture. Pass the suture through the labrum. Probably nothing you haven't seen if you uh, watch shoulder surgery. Just there's not as much room to navigate in the hip. The hip's a little tighter. You know, there's, you have to, the hip still has to be distracted, otherwise you know, this is going to go gouging out the femoral head. Um, so the suture gets passed through. And even your angle of approach, the femoral nerve is just medial to the hip, so you have a, a somewhat small window to work on. Restabilizes the, the labrum back to the rim of the acetabulum. And first, I don't think his pincer lesion was all that big, to tell you the truth. I think the majority of his problem is going to come from a cam lesion, which you'll see. But I think it was in this particular case, you know, uh, the thought was you know, take care of everything and anything. And that's kind of been, I think there's two schools of thought with hip arthroscopy right now. You can take a minimalist approach to breathe the labrum and see how they do versus, you know, taking care of everything because, you know, you don't want to find out that it didn't work. And that's just an arthroscopic sliding knot that ties that down. And now the labrum is kind of re-secured to the acetabulum, but it's brought over the, over the top of that rim of bone that was kind of resected away. So it's recovered and not exposed. <coughs> two more to the right. And finally, the cam debridement. I think this, this is really the, the problem with this guy. Um, you can see now, now you're looking. Now the head, with the traction is taken off, and the head is back reduced into the acetabulum. So here, this is the true articular cartilage of the femoral head here. And this is the head neck junction, and there's a little bit of glare. Here's the true femoral neck. And there's this bony prominence right here. So again, this at, at this point in the operation, this hip is flexed about 30, 30 degrees or so. So you see it almost has like a fibrocartilage covering on top of it. And the middle is, this is the real superior part of the hip. So again, this is anterior superior. That should be, con you can tell that it's concave, it should be convex. You peel all the cartilage off of it. You can kind of dive, define where the true articular margin starts. And what I do when I do these is I'll actually, before I start this, I'll bring the hip up into hyperflexion so you can relieve. Now that we're not in traction, I have free mobility of the hip and start moving the hip around and see, like, you know, where's the actual bone impinging on the labor? Because I don't want to take off, I want to take off enough bone to prevent impingement but not so much bone that I risk putting a stress rise around the femoral neck and causing a, either a fracture or a stress fracture, which I can tell you has occurred after this operation in people. 
so it's, it's not as benign as you might think. And now you can see what's happened is, now here's the, the true articular margin of the femoral head, and this is the cam lesion being resected. <coughs> kind of systematic working from an most anterior aspect of the hip all the way to anterior superior over here. But the prominence is still here. Everything's magnified, obviously, in our thoroscopy. So I've done some cam lesions where I'll just take off what I think is just a little nub of bone, and I I'll put them on crutches after surgery, but they're for their comfort only. In this particular case, you'll see this is a much more extensive debridement so we elected to keep this guy on crutches for four weeks after the operation. And why I like to look at how much of the femoral neck was debriding. And that's, you know, that's down to kind of cancellous bone. But it ends up nice and flat and concave. So now when this hip is hyperflex, that little, that, this is kind of finishing touches on it. Now it's nice and smooth. And so when I'm done with this, I'll, I'll actually hyperflex the hip. And you'll see that that articular cartilage goes right under the acetabular rim and labrum but this bone doesn't impinge on the acetabulum itself. And that's what you're really looking for with this particular operation. So again, what's transpiring as time goes on in this uh, labral tear, labral repair, femoral acetabular impingement concept is that it's uncommon for somebody to have an isolated labral tear without some form of predisposing impingement, either cam, pincer, or combined. So I think that, that covers about everything. So that's a, a, hopefully a pretty comprehensive coverage of all the hip problems that I deal with from time to time. Any questions? Yeah. With FAI, what percentage um, of those do you think uh, are caused by um, uh, antiverted or retroverted hips, if at all? I think, uh, I think there is a small percentage, probably around, I shouldn't say small, probably around 20% are caused by an antiverted hip. You know, that just over the years, that's what's led to that exostosis. The other thing that I think is a relatively common cause of it is a, is a subtle slip. Like in other words, you know, I talked about slip capital femoral pips as being a, a something to watch for. But you see some of these big guys, like the big football players who have these, and they have that oval <coughs> hip joint already. And I wonder if when, you know, they were bigger than they should have been when they were kids, they're bigger than they are when they're football players. I'm wondering if they were starting to get a little bit of a slip, or, you know, kind of like a stress fracture of the, of the capital femoral emphasis that led to that shape of that head because they really do look funny. You know, it isn't a round ball. It's really like an oval ball in a round socket. So you, you so um, uh, do you think most of them are congenital or do you think they're caused by, by the sports or activities? I think, it's a com I think most of them are caused by the sports and activities, but I think there's a small component of them that have a congenital component to it. I mean, I, I, it's hard to really tell right now. We'd have to almost do just like they look at, you know, you can look at the glenoid retroversion in, in pictures, you know, and, and you, now that they're starting to follow kids all the way from Little League through college, you see that the kids that throw a lot have more version than the kids that don't. I think, you know, you may find that, you know, if, they, if this gets enough attention, that we'll have to do longitudinal work from like the, the very young age through the college career to see what, if there's uh, changes in the acetabular bone because of either a patient's size or participation in particular sports. I mean, wrestling is a very common problem. We're actually going to try to do a study at the Division One National where we look at we're going to we're going to have an X-ray machine down there and X-ray as many co ex-college wrestlers and coaches as we can and see what the incidence of hip arthritis and is in the group. Because I mean, I, you know, if you look at Dan Gable, um, you know, uh, Ken Churchow, these are guys who are 45 years old needed bilateral hip replacement because they wrestled their brains out their whole life, and it's a it's a big problem. So I, it's got to be. It can't just be that all wrestlers have a congenital problem with their hip. That's got to be sport related. But we don't know the answer yet. Are you seeing any trends with um, occurrences in dominant versus non dominant extremities? No. no. Not at all. But the, the femoral, a lot of times, you know, what's interesting to me is when I look at patients who have, I can tell you, this particular wrestler, we're going we're gonna to go down and do his other hip because the feeling is that he's a setup for this and he's really not that symptomatic in the other hip, but the thought being that you, know, you want to prevent it from getting as bad because, again, there's a, the current, there's a lot of push right now to be saying that this femoral acetabular impingement may be a precursor of hip arthritis at a young age, but we won't know the answer to that for about 15 or 20 years, really. You, you may be doing all this for nothing. You see one hip versus both hips. Do you see any trends for bilateral? 
you mean doing both at the same time? Well, yeah, when they come in symptomatic on one side, do you find that it's also present on the other, just not symptomatic uh, or not? Yes, I, I find it's present on the other side, but not symptomatic, yes. And then eventually? No, a lot, of, not. a lot of people just seem to go just go one, one side. Kind of hard to figure out. Why? One, why? one becomes symptomatic. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'm sure that there's probably some injury that occurs at one point in their career that kind of tips the scales to the side of being symptomatic. I mean, you think that it's just like, you know, why do why do swimmers end up with one only one shoulder that hurts? Mm -hmm. I'll never figure that one out. And I just ask because we see this quite a bit with uh, our level soccer players, and we, it's always tended to be in their dominant shooting leg. Oh really? Yeah. That'd be interesting. Well, there's a lot more attention being paid, so probably more research will be done, and mm -hmm. maybe that is the right answer. All right. Kids, we're talking about rehab now, right? Is that the whole thing? Thank you, Dr. Gatt. Sure.